Well, thank you all for the, making it to the last session of the day. It's always a, a good, a good uh, place to, to be. Um, I'm going to talk about work I'm doing on Blue Waters that involves simulating thunderstorms at extremely high resolution, ultra high resolution. We're running out of adjectives almost. We get down to, say, 30 or 20 meters. Um, I want to quickly acknowledge uh, Robert Wilhelmson especially. He's got the first PRAC, got the ball rolling, got the research going. He's also been my tie to getting in some Illinois money. We've got a PRAC in review now, which is great. Um, hoping for good news on that. Um, and also my collaborators, Bruce Lee, Kathy Finley, Adam Houston, uh, who are part of this work. So briefly, I'll talk about the motivation for this work, look at the process that we are going through to, to try to answer these questions, briefly reflect on the last three or four years of Blue Waters, and then mostly talk about some scientific results that we're very excited about and where the compass points after that. So the problem, tornadoes are a problem. Um, roughly, depending on a lot of different things, you get about 1,000 observed tornadoes per year. Many of them occur in the United States. The good news for humanity in general is that most of these are very weak tornadoes and they don't last very long. But a tiny fraction of the tornadoes that do form are the ones like Greensburg, Kansas, El Reno, Oklahoma, um, Moore, Oklahoma, pick a decade, right? Where you get a big, long track EF5 strength tornado. That's the top <laughs> wind speed um, category for tornadoes. And what makes this worse is we're not very good at predicting whether a storm that has formed, even if it's already formed, whether that storm will go on to produce a tornado, a weak tornado, no tornado, or a long track, say EF5. Um, we're getting much better at predicting the environments in which these occur. Um, and, and these, these uh, the larger scale models the, the, that are predicting three days out, four days out, that there's going to be an outbreak in, in the Midwest, but we just don't know the details yet. That We're getting much better at that, but the details of storm scale stuff is much more difficult. So basically, my approach is, well, if you're going to, as meteorologists, we're always trying to predict, to protect uh, society by predicting, getting people out of the way of storms. Before you can uh, forecast how a storm is going to behave, you sort of know, have to know how it works. And I'm all about just kind of figuring out how stuff works. I just love to pick apart something and drill down into it till we get to the small pieces. So running a supercell simulation at very high resolution is, is, is kind of a neat thing. Um, I should mention that much of the work that's been done to try to answer these questions has involved field programs observing real storms. And this is incredibly important. Um, much of the work that I do, I'm always looking to the observationalist to, to, to communicate, to make sure that we're, what the model is showing makes sense, put it in the context of real meteorology. And that's why I spend so much time. One of the reasons I spend so much time on visualization, because I truly believe that, you know, you really need to, um, if you can't make the storm in the model look like the atmosphere, there's something wrong with your model. So we, we're doing this, we want to be able to sort of pick out uh, storm scale and tornado scale features at very high temporal resolution. So I'm saving data like every second on blue waters, every uh, second of model time, um, in order to capture all the really fast moving air because air in, in the vicinity of tornadoes is moving very fast. We want to know what can make discerns uh, dis uh, th these storms from other less uh, harmful storms and then maybe enable comparison and, you know, it sounds a little off maybe to say to guide, but maybe this work can help guide future, future field studies, future field studies to look at what part of the storm we see some of these features. So to do this, you need a good model. Uh, CM1 I'm using, George Bryan CM1, as has been used in some previous talks. You need a good set of uh, atmospheric conditions adjacent to a real event to initialize the model. And as this is sort of related to what Jeff just said about the hardest part is getting a good control case, getting a supercell to produce a long track EF5 tornado was the scariest part of this whole project. It was the part that came at the end. It didn't come at the beginning. Most of what I spent my time on was some of this other stuff. So um, building code, I, I anticipated this huge data problem we were going to have down the road. I started working on this almost a decade ago. And so I sort of over time built this environment um, to, to make this stuff work pretty well. And essentially, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this today. I've talked about this in previous talks, but I'm using HDF5 and I'm subsetting on a per node basis, saving data, layering extra, uh, uh, using the, the core driver to layer different time levels in memory, buffer them to memory. Um, and then you need code to interface to this data output because you don't want to have to convert this data to anything else. There's just too much of it. So this has taken up a lot of, a lot of time. Briefly, you know, so we started when the first PRACs came out. We started using during the friendly user period. 
Um, it, it, you know, we're, so we're just tuning the model, getting it to run, and it became extremely apparent very early on that it was I.O. that was going to kill us, and we had to do something about I.O. Um, in order to uh, achieve our research goals. So that was what most of the work I've done on this project up to, say, a year or so ago has involved just handling I.O. I've not, it wasn't by, I never intended to become an I.O. guy, but it just sort of happened, <laughs> uh, and in the link to visualization. And then, so once we had the environment, you know, we're coming to the end of an allocation and we still don't have our high-end high tornado. So I'm trying different atmospheric conditions, different atmospheric conditions. And Lou Wicker at the National Center for Severe uh, NSSL, um, he gave me the magic sounding that got this work really going and he deserves a ton of credit. Um, so it was the condition of the 24 May 2011 El Reno EF5 storm. We took a sounding off of that. Uh, the, the right flank of, uh, of, of the observed storm, at least as ingested by the Ruck model, uh, the environment around there. So thus far, recent work, um, we have simulated a storm from start to finish that produces a, a tornado that's on the virtual ground for almost two hours. It's a long track EF5. Uh, we've published two papers on this work. This one is just hot off the press or in press, should I say, in BAMS. Very happy about that. Um, we also have a 20 meter simulation I'm going to spend some time uh, showing you today that is even more intriguing, at least in the tornado structure. So um, the size of the problem, what makes this a blue water size problem? Um, just look at the, the, the bold things. So 30 meter simulation costs about, eight, about 2 billion grid points down 20 meters, uh, 8 billion grid points. We're using, uh, these runs were kind of small, only 625 nodes. These runs are getting a little bit bigger. We're now getting up to, say, uh, you know, a quarter to a third of the machine. And, you know, we can go higher than that. The model scales very well, and um, I'm, I think the I.O. load I can handle. Now, these numbers for I.O., I can make them bigger or smaller. It just depends on how often I save data, how many variables I save, whether I use compression or not, and all that stuff. But these are ballpark numbers, and archiving this is not fun. Um, so an overview of the storm before I get into some of the, the graphical results. So the storm turns into a supercell. It's not a surprise based upon the environment. Lots of cape, lots of shear, lots of low level uh, shear. Storm relative helicities are huge if you're a meteorologist. You know, all the stuff you'd expect is there. Uh, the tornado forms about an hour and a half into the simulation. It lasts for about two hours. And then it's the details of what happened during the tornado formation that we're really focusing on because that's really one of the big areas of research in, in mesoscale meteorology is tornado genesis what leads to the tornado forming, and why don't tornadoes form sometimes, and why do they in other times. Um, we've, to our surprise to some extent, much of the uh, pre-tornado features that we see are not in parts of the storm where we have sort of the conceptual models have, have told us, like in the rear flank of the storm. The downdrafts in the rear flank of the storm really don't seem to be directly influencing the tornado in a major way. It's the forward flank of the storm, and I'll show you pictures of this shortly, where a lot of the, uh, the, the, the vorticity that is going to serve to spin the mesocyclone in the tornado seems to originate from. Um, so I'll we'll talk about these different features and show you uh, pictures shortly. So this is a supercell, just so we're on the same page here. This is a nice picture. Roger Hill took it. Um, this uh, region of the storm is typically referred to as a mesocyclone. It's just a big rotating updraft. So this updraft, huge amounts of, of momentum, air rising upwards, but it's also rotating by virtue of the fact that you have environmental wind shear. Um, you can see that there's a big fat tornado on the ground here. That's a good thing to have for a tornado research project. And over here, this is the forward flank of the storm. So this, this cloud feature here is often called a tail cloud. It forms along and behind the leading edge of the forward flank gust front. So behind this, sort of where the tail of the arrow is, you see this? This is rain or hail. It's falling, it's melting, it's evaporating, it's cooling. The air hits the ground, it spreads out. And the boundary between the environment and the storm, uh, this cloud sort of marks that boundary to some extent. But another reason I showed this is because the feature we're going to be studying really shows that air from this region of the storm is being tilted into, this, into the mesocyclone. And this picture certainly at least suggests that. Um, so that's what we're using it. Now this is what it looks like when you use visit. So I'm trying really hard to capture the scale of the storm, including as many hydrometers as I can to make it, you know, to see if it looks reasonable. So in, including hail shows that you see all these, these, these sort of fall streaks that fall down. Um, and in fact, I'm, since so much of the activity that I, I'm, I'm looking at in this is in the forward, forward flank of the storm, I'm wondering if perhaps I'm going to be looking at hail a lot and looking at how it falls, how it melts, how the temperature gradients 
that are caused by it in the cold pool. Um, I don't know, this is just, these, these visualizations give me ideas of where to go, and that's one of the reasons I do this. Now, just to compare to the previous, there's the tornado, you can barely see it. There's that little tail cloud, you can barely see it. Now, you'll see it in a minute, okay, when I start doing this. But it's really, and there's that, the hail I was referring to. And up here are uh, little, at least, suggestions of what we call mammatus clouds you often see associated with supercell. Um, so this is, you know, it's a challenge to, to make these kinds of graphical images, but that's not the end goal. That's just the, the first part. We want to be able to, to know where to look. Here's another, another, you know, changing some opacity things. There's the tornado. You can barely see it. But this should at least give you an appreciation of the scale of the problem. Most of where I'm going to show you from here on is just focused on this little region right here. Uh, and I, I've been working with David Bach at NCAR, or I'm sorry, I should say NCSA, my mea culpa. Um, so he's, he has a renderer that does just a great job, and his, his really draws out the mammatus clouds up here. Um, here's a tornado in this, his rendering. This is a, a, a shaft of heavy rain. Um, it, it doesn't show all the rain, just the heavy rain. And then this just done a beautiful job at seeing these uh, mammatus type clouds. Now, I'm not entirely sure if this is what a real cloud would look like because we haven't included hail and snow. But it certainly shows that those patterns are there. So, in other words, the visualization helps us to understand the storm, get a first, you know, first cut glimpse at it, and then it drives the research. So this is a, a volume rendered image that, that uh, the Visit software used, uh, created, or Vapor, excuse me, at NCAR. Um, this feature we're calling a streamlined vorticity current. This is the updraft of the storm. This arrow is supposed to indicate the general flow of the air from the forward flank up into the updraft. And this arrow points to this, this new tornado that's just forming. And you see all these little guys right here. Uh, these are all little regions of concentrated vorticity. I'll call them vortices. They do spin in a vortex relative sense, and they're all kind of converging into where the tornado ends up forming. So there's multiple things going on at different scales. Um, this is just a movie showing the tornado forming. We're looking at the cloud and the precipitation field. This little nub here is an anticyclonic vortex. It's not a tornado, but it does show a little bit of condensation. You'll see the cloud streaming in from the right to the left. This is that tail cloud. The tornado condensation funnel descends to the ground. Some rain starts to wrap in around the, the, the mesocyclone or the wall cloud from the rear flank of the storm. This, this uh, is a reasonable realization of a supercell thunderstorm that produces a tornado, um, at least when you compare it to uh, field studies and such. So we're happy about that. Um, even this is a, a figure from a, the BAMS paper that just hit the early online release. Um, even little tiny you know, sub-tornadic sub, sub vortex structure is there. Here's uh, just a little glimpse. This is, a, uh, I think, Tim Samaras took these pictures, I think. Um, so you've got this little horizontal roll that's ascending up the outer periphery of the tornado vortex. We have those two in our simulation. We're barely resolving them. That's this little guy right here. This is the vorticity field. And this little vortex here, you have enough pressure drop in the center of that to, to condense water vapor to form a cloud. And there it is. And, and when you start capturing little stuff like that, and you start seeing that and, and seeing it in nature, it gives you a some confidence that your results are probably uh, in the right ballpark. Now, I'm going to zoom in on this in a second, but this shows you this, the height of a tornado. Uh, this is just 10 kilometers of the domain. It goes up to 20, and the tornado actually goes up quite a bit higher. Uh, the left is the vorticity field shaded by the vertical component of vorticity. So we want to see all three components of vorticity. That's the vorticity magnitude, but we're shading it with the vertical component. What, means, what that means is the red guys are rotating cyclonically or counterclockwise, and the blue guys are rotating anticyclonically. And if it's gray or something in between, it means it's primarily horizontal vorticity. But um, that's how I've shaded this. This is the downdraft in the center of a tornado. This is a two-cell tornado. So it actually has a downdraft in the center of it, and that is consistent with theory and, and chamber simulations. And this is the pressure field, the pressure deficit field. So we just kind of go up here. Um, you know, it's just to show you what the tornado looks like. You can see these sort of intertwined vortices, which is consistent with the two-celled model, the downdraft in the center, vortex breakdown to some extent, um, and on and on and so forth. Um, and you see in, in, in the lower part of the pressure, that uh, lobe of low pressure off the side seems to be affiliated with uh, the flow feature that we're calling the streamwise vorticity current. So this is a uh, vapor image showing uh, trajectories. They're unsteady trajectories, so showing the motion of the air. Um, and so basically what you see is air along this boundary, this is the forward flank of the storm, is, is rising, and, rising and rotating at the same time. Essentially, it's like a, we call it a streamwise vorticity current because it's like a current of vorticity that's rotating in the same, the rotational axis, the vorticity vector is pointed in the same direction as the uh, wind speed vector, a uh, storm relative. 
Um, and this is what it would look like projected in two dimensions. So this, is, this would be north. The camera eye from here is from the northwest looking towards, I'm sorry, looking towards the southeast. Um, here's our tornado, which is full of rain. Somebody's going to fix that problem. Was doing a uh, guy in North, North Dakota. Is he in the room? He's, he's do, doing work on uh, getting centrifuging working uh, for precipitation, hydrometeors and supercells. It's very important. In other words, in real tornadoes, the precipitation gets centrifuged outwards. We don't have that code in our model yet. Um, so because it doesn't exist yet. So the streamwise vorticity current, if you project it in two dimensions, seems to come from the forward flank of the storm and they draw it up and rotate into the, the, the mesocyclone, which is the giant vortex that's sort of uh, supplying, you know, but that is it the rotation of the, of the supercell as opposed to the rotation of the tornado. And there's definitely scales in between that that kind of show up on these images. So, um, and let me show you a quick movie of tornado genesis. So this gray stuff here, this is just vorticity magnitude. And these are cyclonic vortices, or, or this is isosurfaces of cyclonic vorticity. And the blue ones are anticyclonic vorticity. So one thing to realize right away, this is just during genesis. This is the anticyclonic tornado of its, or vortex that's already formed. Our tornado is going to form out of the pool of these guys here. But it's definitely weighted higher towards cyclonic vort vorticity than anticyclonic vorticity. Um, and much of this is horizontal, but this is, this is just showing you the vorticity magnitude. So watch what happens. Um, if you're looking for a, a simple tornado trigger in this simulation, you're not going to find it. What you see is a gradual coalescence of vorticity, at least in, the, in these vortices, and a strengthening of the streamwise vorticity current that's feeding the updraft, and now you have a tornado. Um, stuff going on in the rear flank of the storm doesn't seem to have a direct effect on this particular simulation. At least that's what our, our, our results look like so far. Um, during the maintenance phase of a tornado, so this is when it's just been cranking along forever and ever, um, this, the red arrow now points to the region of the streamwise vorticity current. You're, we're dropping parcels in that region there. The, the green guys that don't show up so well are dropped just a bit in the forward flank. These guys seem to feed the tornado almost directly, so I'm interested in, in, in how the properties of that air. And then we go over towards the rear flank, and this is just a rotated view of the same thing. So you can just kind of see them at the same time. Um, and yeah, it's a tornado, all right. It's rotating like crazy. Um, you can see that primarily the parcels that seem to feed the tornado at low levels come from the cool side in the, um, in the, in the cold pool. And this is an interesting result because it's easier to lift warm, less dense air than it is to lift cold, higher density air. That's kind of intuitive, and it's actually true. If you have cold pools that are too cold, you're going to have a hard time uh, forming tornadoes. And there's other reasons beyond the lift issue. but um, it's definitely a problem. Now I'm going to show you the death of this tornado. So this tornado, the 30 meter simulation, um, the, the tornado dies after about two hours. So in this case, I'm volume rendering the, the W component of the wind. So this is downdraft air and this is updraft air. So blues are downdrafts and these uh, warmer colors are updraft air. And the tornado is, this, is, rel is represented by vorticity magnitude in this white tube. You can see there's some more vorticity outside there. That's a common feature in this simulation. But right, you'll just see this thing just dies really fast. Um, right about there, it just poof, the downdraft, uh, it, you know, the source of the air from that downdraft is, we'll have to look into that, but it is raining heavily in this region, but there's also probably non-hydrostatic pressure forces at play here. But regardless, the, the tornado, much like it was born, it, hap it sort of came about rather quickly, it dies rather quickly. It, it just gets stomped on, essentially. And that has been observed. It's not the most common form of tornado uh, decay. Usually you see the, the gust front sort of stick out, uh, pull the tornado out, kind of stretches it out, ropes out as they say. That, this one doesn't do that. It just it, it holds on to for its dear life until it, until it dies. So for the rest of the talk I want to focus on two, uh, looking at an earlier phase of the 30 meter simulation. This is the one we published. We haven't gone back, we're just starting to go back even earlier to sort of look at how the storm structure changes over time well before tornado genesis. So in this movie I'm going to show you, um, again, gray is, this is vorticity magnitude, and it's shaded by the vertical component. If there's very little vertical component, it's going to be gray. So this is horizontal vorticity. So you can imagine air rotating in this plane, and you can imagine air sort of becoming rotating into the vertical plane over time. And it, if it turns red, it's rotating the direction we like in the northern hemisphere for tornadoes. If it's blue, it's rotating the other direction. And this is the cold pool and the camera view. And I'll just let this run. So keep an eye. Here's our vorticity kind of streaming in. It gets tilted and it becomes vertical. And over time, you will see a sort of increase in vorticity in the mesocyclone up here. Um, 
but I'll just let it go. So let me just say a few words about volume rendering. One of the, I was asked by a hardware manufacturer who was working on an app or a, or a software to do volume rendering, why do you use it? Why don't you just do ISO surfaces? Because a lot of scientists like ISO surfaces. Because you can do this, you can show different scales of motion or different uh, scales of magnitude of values and you can sort of look into the storm. So here we go again with the vorticity taking the turn and then you're gonna start to see a lot more reds here. Um, and you're seeing both the sort of diffuse vorticity coming from the, the forward flank and then you're gonna see very sharp regions in the vortices that follow. And right about, look, keep your eyes peeled right in this region and it's a tornado at some point, I mean, I, it, there it is. So it's, if I were to say, you know, this is a process of apparently, um, what's causing the tornado is the big question, but there's certainly an increase in the amount of, of vorticity, the streamwise vorticity current seems to be getting more intense. You're seeing more reds, you're seeing more ingestion of that. And this is just one view, but you see, um, these little vortices are only piece of the story. So you see these little vortices merging together into the tornado, but as I've decreased the lower threshold of the vorticity so I can see more what's going on, I realize that these vortices are important. They're probably important because they directly provide vorticity to the tornado, but the streamwise vorticity current is providing vorticity to the mesocyclone, which is then causing the tornado. And that whole process is, I'm just dying to pull it apart because it's, it's really interesting. Um, and yeah, this goes on. So, um, but it's fat. There's just so much detail. It's beautiful. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, there's some, the whole lot of scientific questions that I think can be answered from some of these simulations over time. You'll start to see. So here's where the rear flank of the storm is. You're getting some, some, uh, low, th low theta E air here. Some, uh, positively buoyant, but dry air, probably from high levels getting kicked out. And then you start to see the, the tornado becoming occluded. So you start to see the tornado is it's in there. You can sort of see it, but it's hiding behind some other vorticity as well as the rear flank sort of kicks in. So we've still got work to do on this simulation at 30 meters, but um, we decided to try a 20 meter simulation in the same environment. We did tweak uh, the turbulence closure on this to a better one than we did in the first simulation. Um, but other than that, it's identical. And we get another EF5 tornado. Although in this case, the tornado itself looks really, really good. So I'm just gonna show you, this is just hot off the presses. Well, not too hot, but it's not too cold either. Um, I haven't really analyzed it much yet. But uh, I'll start out with the cloud and the rain field as before. And just to let you know, right in the first frame, we've already got an anticyclonic tornado um, going on. And so again, this is the region you want to focus in on. And you'll see the real tornado, the EF5 forms about here. It very quickly becomes an EF5. Um, that streamlined vorticity current, I haven't looked for it yet, but you, and you do see that the, the clouds here in the tail cloud region tend to be more convective, tend to be more cellular than we saw with the other simulation where it was more laminar and that could be just resolution. Now we're gonna look at the vorticity field during tornado genesis for the 20 meter run. I will put the cloud field up here as a reference in a second because this goes back a little earlier. So we start out with this blue guy uh, going on and, and actually, you know, there have been, people have seen anticyclonic tornadoes before but look at all of a sudden you see this eruption of reds and yellows where all of a sudden you have all this cyclonic vorticity and boom, there's your tornado. Now I look at that and I go, what could cause that? The only thing I can think of is the updraft just must get really strong at low levels really quickly so that it's starting to stretch vorticity that's near the ground. That's my theory. Now what I'm doing here is I'm playing with the, op the opacity maps. I'm now going down to a, a much higher threshold so you can start to see the tornado circulation really well. And this is really exciting. So the tornado, is really broken down into a, a, a multiple vortex. And you can see the two vortices. You can see actually there's several vortices in here. And this is consistent with other models that have been run that are just tornado models, just using the chamber approach where you just simulate the updraft as a boundary condition. Um, but this is, this is really encouraging because I think this is probably how most tornadoes that are this uh, large really turn out. And you can see the the, how it goes. Now I'm going to go, kind of go back to lower thresholds, playing with the opacity threshold so you can see as the tornado winds down a bit, it widens, the maximum vorticity values go down, the circulation probably doesn't change nearly as much, but, um, and then you can see what's going on. And eventually what happens is it's just rain, it's a huge flux of rain, rain comes down and down drafts and everybody kind of gets squashed, but the tornado kind of dies after that. So sort of coming to the end, um, for future work, we, 
obviously have made a lot of, done a lot of work on visualization, and I do this not just because of the pretty pictures, but because it is key to understanding these storms with all this data. You've got hundreds of terabytes of data, and you need to make sense out of it. And I found that you know, volume rendering especially can be a very effective, very dense amount of information per frame, you could say. We definitely want to dive more into the 20 meter simulation, do more of these, um, incorporate surface friction properly, play with the surface boundary condition. I also need to upgrade to the latest version of CM1. George tells me he's done some stuff with the surface that's probably important, and do more environments. Um, and just some parting thoughts. Um, you know, this is, a lot, a lot of the talks I've seen here are like, they blow my mind. This is like the first time this has been done. You just can't do this kind of research on other machines or without HPC resources. But it can be done, this is really exciting. We have the convergence of hardware, software, and uh, the meteorological observations. These different features we've identified and we've written in our paper um, are intriguing and we need to look more deeply into them, more quantitatively. We want to do more work with the 20 meter run and um, really ensembles at 30 meters, maybe not at 30 meters, but we do need to do more simulations because it's very dangerous to draw too many conclusions from a single simulation or in a single environment. So we've certainly got plenty of work cut out for us and I'd be happy to answer any questions. So I'm curious, when I, when I see these visualizations, I see these sort of vorticity tubes, it seems like they have very characteristic sizes. What is it that causes those like, the characteristic width? Mm, that's a really good question. That's a very good question. Um, and I don't have a, a clear answer. There's something called the swirl ratio when you start studying tornadoes and looking at, you know, when you look at tornadoes, they typically start out as sort of like a thin little, tiny little thin tornado. It's called a single cell tornado with, it's dominated by updraft air. And then over time, it widens and you have to look at the ratio of the air coming in to the strength of the updraft. So you just get a whole spectrum of, of vortex sizes. Um, is there a characteristic vortex width for a multiple vortex tornado? That's a tough question. I don't have the answer to that. Um, I do think that most tornadoes probably have multiple vortex characteristics. Um, and I don't think some of our radars are able to capture that. But, um, but yeah, that's a good question. And I would assume that that may be sensitive to other parameterization choices as well, friction and, and, and looking at turbulence and uh, turbulence closure. Jeff. Hey, great stuff, obviously. Um, so these simulations were done on the bracelet floor above? Yes. So I, I guess I'm still, I mean, we talked about this before, I'm still having trouble trying to reconcile the use of a free boundary and therefore the absence of... Absence of conver radial convergence and they make the tornado, absolutely. Well, not, I, not, well, I guess not just that so much, but you alluded to the possibility of a vortex breakdown and... Um, yeah. I am too. In fact, and I continue to try to incorporate friction. I continue to turn it on and I continue to run simulations with it. And it has an extremely dramatic effect on the storm structure. And this is all, and it shouldn't really surprise us too much. And I'm not entirely sure that the, the way that CM1 is doing friction in version 16 is necessarily as good as version 18. George has done some things with friction. But the, the fact of the matter is when I turn friction on, even if I use a very small drag coefficient or a very small Z naught, roughest length, it, it affects the surface in a, in a significant way. You get a tornado that is, I do get an EF5 tornado, or a tornado at least, I have done that, but it's like, a, it starts in the, well deep in the cold pool, it's weak, it just kinda, so this is, it's kind of infuriating in a way because the free slip, I don't wanna have the free slip condition, but it, it's working. And maybe, just maybe, I mean, I've seen enough video of tornadoes where the air, the inflow into a tornado, you see a lot of the damage that is caused is the inflow that's coming in to fill the void that the tornado has produced. The air near the ground is moving so fast. So if your first grid point is, say, 15 meters above the ground and you're basically saying, I'm going to slow all this air down, it may just break things. So that's why we need to go to higher and higher vertical resolution. This, this would be a, a two blue water size problem to get down to meter resolution near the ground. But we're gonna head in that direction. And again, I don't know. And I continue to try to, to incorporate friction and look at its effects in a, in a reasonable manner. So, when I see this, I'm wondering, you made, you made a comment about this affecting the vessel cycle. But when, when I see this, I'm wondering what, what role is there Right. In a mesocycle, is there, is there really a, a mesocycle? Is there, I mean, it doesn't, 
a quantifiable larger scale circulation at the ground or near the ground that precedes your, your tornado formation? When you look at, like, what's the typical vorticity threshold usually to, to determine a mesocyclone 0.01? Yeah, but, and we're talking about, like, we've got two orders of magnitude larger than that. When you look at the mesocyclone, like, you take a, like a good old cross, I don't have it one ready, but you do see the general large-scale sort of tilting of vorticity mesocyclone you'd expect. But embedded within that, it's a turbulent mess. So that streamized vorticity current is sort of, maybe it's, you know, it's feeding part of the mesocyclone, but it's, it's too narrow to be the mesocyclone. So it's like a new flow feature that's somehow incorporating, and it must get entwined with the, the tornado at a loft. I haven't looked at a loft too much, but it's a new thing. I don't know if it exists in nature. Honestly, we haven't seen it. Um, we haven't really drilled down. Um, it, but it's certainly an efficient mechanism to transport horizontal vorticity that's generated in the forward flank into a nice compact region of vertical vorticity. And that has to have an effect. I mean, you're adding all this lovely rotating air in this huge, this updraft, which is really strong. So maybe there's some feedbacks going on where the pressure drops, the, 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 the low level updraft gets really strong, and then that gets the tornado forming. I, I think there's probably some feedbacks involved in this. What do you perceive as the biggest computational challenge going forward? Uh, biggest computational challenge going forward is going to be handling I.O. I mean, I, it sounds so trite, but the truth is the model runs pretty well. At, it scales well. The model will scale well. Getting that data to disk and, and then being able to analyze it. I can, the, the system I've built can handle the 20 meter simulation. It can probably handle a 15 to a 10 meter simulation as we get to like use more of the machine if we get that opportunity. Um, it's going to be I.O. It's going to be handling all that data. And then, because I can, the part of the storm that's important is pretty small compared to the whole thing. So I can just save the data. The, the way I, my, data, my IO works is I can just save data in that region because they're in separate files. Toss out the rest of it. I don't want to, but then I could at least do analysis on the tornado. So, but it's really, that's, that's the main problem. Um, and then properly incorporating friction. It, we may need to get down to just ridiculously high resolution at the surface to get friction right, and that's going to be challenging. Actually, if you use the Darshan profiling tool to look at I.O. performance, is that relevant to your work? Or do you pretty much know where the I.O. bottlenecks are and just wish it was faster? Um, the I.O. bottlenecks, uh, Darshan, I ha I've just started to use it a little bit. It hasn't given me any information that's useful. A lot of the I.O. problems I see, I think, have to do with the fact that it's, it's you know, a shared resource. And sometimes I.O. takes a long time when it, other times it doesn't. And I'm, not, you know, and I'm actually working with with. NCSA on trying to sort of figure out how to speed up IO and such. So we're sort of profiling doing things. But the buffered, the core driver of the HDF core driver should be really fast because you're, at least when you're writing data to memory, right? You're writing data to memory. You don't have to send it to IO. So that should be super, super fast. And sometimes it's not, and I don't know why. So there's some, there's, yeah, we're trying to figure out some of these things. Um, but the truth is we've managed to, I can create a petabyte of data in 12 hours on Blue Waters easily. Challenge accepted? Maybe not. But, you know, I mean, <laughs> my point is we can get, but then it's like, what do you do with it? And what if, you know, I've had individual luster uh, files, uh, individual luster machines run out of data. That's always fun. One of your files, it says, you know, uh, you're, out of, you're out of space in this, in this, no, you're not. It's just a big luster file. So, well, one of the actual luster things was out of space. So there's these, all these issues with the I.O. where you, you, lose a, you lose a piece of your storm because some hardware failure or some software thing. So those challenges are also pretty big. One last question. So are you sharing the data with the community or some special? I, my plans are to share both the data and to share the code that I've written, for instance, to get the data to do and visit, but I'm not there yet. Um, I just transitioned to a new job. I just, you know, I'm just starting to get into a more research focused position. Um, so I want to sort of make sure I get my stake in the ground before I give all my cool tools away. But the truth is, yeah, I, I do intend to I would love to uh, actually put this on like a uh, somewhere it could be curated and we could do all so people could play with it and maybe do you know do research with it seriously but I get the first cut okay please <laughs> <laughs> please <laughs> after I get you know the grants worked out then we'll give it away but well, no seriously again. thank you